Manhattan Stardust, Chapter 10, Uncertainty and Achilles' Heels To hear Helena talk about uncertainty, you'd think it was a sure thing. In principle, I mean, she explained patiently to Jennifer, Miranda, and me, the founding trinity of our Shangri-La. So what you're saying, said Jennifer, is that the more you know about one part of something, the less you know about another. Or, interrupted Miranda, do you mean that you can't know anything for sure? Except that April 15th is tax deadline, I said. And Helena laughed and started over again. She'd softened up since she'd been granted permanent residency in Arcady with the formality of citizenship just around the corner. You see, like everybody else, she had an Achilles heel which in her case wasn't a heel at all, but her face and certain aspects of her body. If you recall, she once threw a bowl of pasta at me for cracking a joke about symmetry. I hadn't realized at the time that she was pretty sensitive about her looks, and I thought I had managed to convince her that just because one eye was a little higher than the other, which I personally found ravishing, didn't mean she wasn't beautiful. True, she wasn't beautiful in the way that Jennifer and Miranda were beautiful, but they weren't beautiful in the way that she was, either, and all of this took quite a lot of toing and froing after the honeymoon when we all four of us gazed up at the Big Dipper and the quaternary star system she convinced us resided there. Like Jennifer and Miranda, Helena also had a temper, and her temper was on a short fuse connected to anything that involved her looks. But that's how all women are anyway, so we could live with that. What was a bit harder to live with was the sheer magnitude of her brain power. Being an astroparticle physicist, or a particle astrophysicist, whatever, who didn't deal with particles anyway because she was all about strings and multiple dimensions, but never mind... She had a pretty over-healthy regard for her being smart in that particular kind of way, a way that didn't include how to make money grow, how to play or burn a musical instrument, or how to drive a stick shift. I think I mentioned that when I first met her and became the first man she kissed since she was in kindergarten because I kissed like a woman, she told me about a dozen or two recent ex-girlfriends. If you were an accountant, unafraid to tread where angels feared to rush in, you might surmise that her combination of braininess, temper, and an extremely tender Achilles heel had something to do with the revolving door. I could add things up, as long as I added in the uncertainty principle, and I summed it up like this. She was a piece of work. But there was no uncertainty about the fact that she'd added a whole new dimension to a paradise that was full of the kinds of glorious uncertainties I'd never imagined. Miranda and Jennifer loved hearing about Helena's descriptions of the cosmos. I loved how she talked about the stars, and Helena loved the attention she got when she let her long, dark hair down and started to dress up a little and use a touch of eyeshadow. Helena started back in on the informal physics lecture. Another breakthrough, because there was a time when she was either so shy about her work or so convinced it wasn't interesting to anyone outside her field that she would have stormed off in a huff after a question she interpreted as ridicule. Miranda and Jennifer seemed to follow the technicalities, but I was lost except for the take-home message about hedging your bets, which I thought applied to people as well as subatomic particles. For example, not long ago, my mom extended the hand to help Miranda by introducing her to her new beau, a middle-aged professorial type who taught English lit at NYU and co-edited a poetry rag. Miranda was batting a thousand when it came to getting her poetic oeuvre published. Not a single trope had been accepted. Mom generously thought that a convivial meeting lubricated by her best Italian recipes and the best wine I could afford to bring would fuel a meeting of the minds and help Miranda get a foot in the academic door. 
So Miranda gleefully carted along a dozen of her finest, fully prepared to give a non-Caliban-type vocal performance. To my ears, they were great stuff, all about the suffering woman, suffering men, and poverty, and class warfare waged by these smart and sensitive Sapphos and Dianas of the world, with the sight of Athena thrown in. But she never got to the reading stage, and I'll try to explain why. Gerald could hardly take his eyes off Miranda's legs, and when he did, he committed the folly of lavishing in a slightly slurred way after the second bottle of wine, praise on Ernest Hemingway. Now, you may quibble about the author Hemingway, and I wouldn't rate him in my own personal pantheon, but de gustibus, to each his own, there's no accounting for taste, etc. However, mentioning Hemingway to Miranda was like showing a red cape to a bull. Except in the matter of Italian and Spanish footwear, Miranda was strictly vegan, and with the exception, perhaps, of an incident involving a violin, strictly pacifist. The allusion to the meat-eating, big-game-hunting, bullfight-loving, gun-toting, machismo-glorifying author turned her momentarily into the opposite of her espoused ideals. In short, she slapped Gerald's face and then bit the hand that was trying to squeeze her thighs. Who would have predicted? At any rate, Mom was much better off kicking him out. That's what I mean about uncertainty. So, said Jennifer, uncertainty is kind of like the Achilles heel of the universe. Yes, exclaimed Helena. But what about space, I asked, waking from my reverie. What about it? asked Miranda. I mean, I said, most of it's empty, and if it's empty, there can't be any room for uncertainty. I started to laugh, but Helena not so humorously interrupted. Space isn't empty, Gary. What you think is empty isn't. It's like I'm trying to find the right way to make it understandable to you. I winced a little, to be honest, and then Miranda said, it's like a rest note and a melody, and Jennifer added, or a pause and a dialogue between two actors, and Helena said, yes, 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 you girls are so smart. And I winced a little more. But let's get back to heels, Helena, said Jennifer. What are you wearing for your talk? Just the usual. What? Flats? exclaimed Miranda. You've got to be kidding. Heels are de rigueur for legs like yours and she was showing off her French to boot. Helena began to blush, and before I knew it, the girls had whisked her off to prep her for the upcoming event. Gary, said Jasper, no longer doing that thing with his hands and wrists or twirling his hair, when's the seminar? The seminar was the event, and it was going to be on in two weeks at Columbia, and Helena was one of the two principal speakers. Shangri-La was invited, of course, and we were eager to lend our fellow comrades support, especially because she tended to get nervous in public, and unlike virtually every other astronomer, cosmologist, astrophysicist, or particle astrophysicist I knew, she hadn't done a PBS documentary or written a bestseller. She was strictly science. And what's the topic, he asked. The edge of the cosmos, I responded. But Helena is talking about nothing. I mean, about the nothing that's really something out in outer space and in, inside the atom. That's a lot to discuss in 20 minutes. Yeah, she's nervous, but so am I. And I confess to my friend that although the Garden of Eden was in full bloom, I was fast becoming a wallflower because of my intellectual shortcomings. I just couldn't understand the stuff about multiverses, strings, relativity, space-time, bosons, and on and on, no matter how hard I tried. Jasper, I'm a numbers guy, black and white. She's on a higher plane, and what's worse, Jennifer and Miranda are right up there with her. Jasper regarded me for a moment, and I could soon see the way his eyes widened and the smile broke out that he was in danger of being gripped by an idea, which meant that he would soon grip me with it. 
so I braced myself, and sure enough, here it came. Carrie, I've got it. What? An idea. I figured as much. Listen to me. Don't be so morose. I've got something so good it'll be like a triple play and a home run all in one. Okay, I replied hesitantly. Eureka, my friend, not just okay. First, what's the setup? You know, where, how long, who's moderating, all that stuff. So I gave him the goods and threw in the fact that the moderator was Helena's boss, the kind of physicist who charmed the quarks out of late-night TV hosts, and that after the seminar, at the mix and mingle over a few cheap wines and moldy cheese outside the auditorium, courtesy of the combined efforts of the physics and astronomy departments of Columbia, the posse would be able to congratulate its new citizen. All the better. What you've got to do, my friend, is so simple, even you can do it. It's beautiful, and it's so easy, it's almost, it's almost too easy. You'll be thanking me for the rest of your life for this one, Gary. Yeah, yeah. Now, are you going to mope around like a Higgs that's lost its way? Or do you want some asymptotic freedom? Good, he continued without waiting for a response. Here's what you do. At the end of the session, there's always a Q&A. And, st- and since this is a talk for the GP, general public, don't interrupt, there'll be a handful of the dumbest of the dumb. Except, and he got that glint in his eye, there will be an exception. You. Wait, Jasper, I can't. I'm not. Keep quiet. Yes, you can. Yes, you are. Calm down. But there are no buts about it. I'll be there to give you moral support. Just give me a few days, and I'll have the perfect question. And what the perfect question will do is this. You'll impress your girlfriend, the astrophysicist. You'll impress your other two girlfriends. And you'll give your former platonic friend a chance to show off in front of her boss. You'll have impressed the hell out of everybody. See what I mean? It's a triple play and a grand slam combined. Well, I met Jasper several days later in Midtown. He was drooling with a wild surmise from what I could tell halfway down the block outside the bar. Carrie, he said, I've got it. The perfect pitch. What pitch? Your question. It can't be a softball lob, and it can't be a zinger in the edge of the plate. You don't want Helena to foul one off. You've only got one shot, and you won't have time to warm up in the bullpen. You've got to pitch a strike right down the middle so she can kiss it head on and round the bases, and you can look like a star. And I'm giving it to you on a platter. Are you ready? No. What are the relativistic aspects of quantum gravity and the implications for the fabric of space-time? I have no idea. Of course not. But they do. Who? Your ex girlfriend and the other eggheads on the panel. That's the question. But what does it mean? Trust me, Gary. I've done quite a bit of research on this one. Helena will eat it up, and you'll be licking your chops like the Cheshire Cat later that night. Here, I wrote it down for you. All you've got to do is get up and read. The rest is an absolute certainty. But, Jasper, see you next week, buddy. I've got to run back to Queens before Emilio gets home. Things I do for you. And he was off, and I was left holding a bag in the shape of a question I couldn't even begin to understand. Jennifer, Miranda, Emilio, Jasper, and I occupied a row in the small auditorium, and Jasper made sure I was strategically near an aisle and at his elbow. I was clutching the scrap of paper with the fateful question in hand while scanning the audience of octogenarians, mainly, and a sprinkling of yuppie parents with the grade school kids they were trying to shove into geniushood. Helena was seated on stage looking a bit ruddier than usual because of the rouge deftly applied by Jennifer. She sported a gorgeous pair of heels, courtesy of Miranda, to complement an upgrade of the jeans and blouse uniform. As I've said before, she wasn't exactly the head-turning type of knockout, but tonight she was definitely a heart-melting inferno, at least to me and the girls. At her side was a nearly bald and unkempt 
Nobel Prize aspirant who gave the impression that any moment away from the telescope or a blackboard was a moment wasted. He drank lots of water as the moderator entered to make her introductions, and he checked his wristwatch often. It was easy to see why Helena's boss was a favorite on the talk show circuit and at PBS. She was very easy on the eyes, and she had enough energy to power up the LHC, an acronym that was thrown around all evening like race after a wedding, all by herself. She began by thanking the audience and expressing her delight at being able to bring cutting-edge research about the quote-unquote edge of all edges to the people. And she gave a brief review of her recent bestsellers, including The Polyverse, Big Bang or Bigger Bust, Wormholes of Destiny, Brain, Power, Down the Black Rabbit Hole, String, A Song of Sixpence and Other Dimensions, The Guts of G-U-T, and several more that escaped me. Twenty minutes of her enthusiasms went by, and I can't remember much else of what she said, but I did take note of her long red hair, her smile, and a set of legs unencumbered by much of a skirt. The bald-headed visionary got up and spoke in equations to a nodding and nodding-off audience as he showed about a thousand slides. In deference to the general public, he threw in two or three cartoons whose punchlines were too fuzzy to read, so he read them, but in the same monotone he read his equations. He was apparently also some kind of acronym expert. He could have patented a new kind of alphabet soup, which I felt I was drowning in. LHC, head of the list, followed by CERN, CMBR, DAMA, COBE, CDMS, WMAP, QCD, QE, BICEP, which had a ring of sorts, LIGO, and GUT, to reel off a few. Thankfully, it was Helena's turn to bring the proceedings to an end and rouse us from torpor. She kept the equations to a minimum and the easy-to-grasp metaphors to a maximum so that there was a semblance of life again, or at least wakefulness in the crowd. I couldn't really fathom the gist, but I was happy for her, and I probably applauded a bit over loud, but who cares? And then I remembered, with Jasper's prodding, my pitch, and I started to sweat. The redhead congratulated the speakers and practically begged us for questions. A mother flung what must have been her daughter, all of eight years of age by my reckoning, out of her seat. Is the universe big? Yes, darling, it is very, very big, answered the redhead. Does the universe have an outside, asked a slightly older boy, also in the front row. And then Jasper hit me so hard in my side with his elbow that I made a noise, and the redhead pounced. Yes, the gentleman on the left and at the rear, bring him the microphone. And there I was, on my feet, sweating up a storm and fumbling for the paper with my question, except that in my dread and sweat and angst I had torn it to shreds and I was left to fend for myself. Jasper, seeing my dilemma, began to hiss some clues, but I could hardly hear him, and instead, when the moment of truth arrived, I blurted out, Is supersymmetry relative? I thought I saw Helena flinch, but I couldn't tell, and I have no idea how supersymmetry got into my head, except that it harked back to my joke at her apartment when she responded with spaghetti. But what I could tell was that the redhead strode across the front of the stage and publicly thanked me and told the audience that questions like this made her work and, she was no doubt speaking for the other panelists, their work all worthwhile. She then proceeded to go on a rant about Einstein and somebody called Susie, and just before she wrapped things up, without giving Helena a chance to respond to the question meant for her, she wanted to mention her very latest book, Super Duper Symmetry, which she'd be happy to sign for people afterwards, and would we all share a bit of wine and cheese now, and thank you, Larry and Helena. Well, I thought, as our troop filed to where the snacks and beverages were, were to congratulate our star, I impressed one person at least. Jasper was shaking his head. 
Miranda and Jennifer regarded me quizzically, and on my way to give Helena a hug and sound her out for any pasta-hurling impulses, I was stopped in my tracks. "'Excuse me,' said the redhead, "'but I think I should know somebody as smart as you. "'Are you one of Frank's colleagues?' "'Uh, oh, you mean me? "'No, I work with Bernie. "'I might have guessed. "'His work is fabulous, and you must be... "'Gary, I just crunched the numbers. "'That's exactly what our field needs, "'numbers theorists like you.' And she signed a copy of Super Duper Symmetry and invited me to a quiet drink so she could pick my brain as soon as Hoi Poloi got the hell out of here and maybe she could read me one of the chapters from her new book on the antiverse. She had greenish eyes that sparkled, I admit, and a soft touch as I could feel in my left shoulder, much softer than the yank I felt on my right. There was Helena, fortunately without pasta, although she held a menacing cracker in hand. Her boss complimented her in her nice little talk and said, Helena, I'd like you to meet Gary. Thanks, Jessica. We've already met. Oh, one of your secret collaborators? <laughs> Why haven't you told me? No wonder your work's been so good lately. <laughs> yes, Jessica, we are collaborators. He's my boyfriend. Your what? The boss's eyes bulged. You heard me. But I was sure you were, well, you know, I know. And I'm not, well, not all the time. I guess it's relative, Jessica smirked. Generally speaking, said Helena, as she took my arm and escorted me off the premises. At Jennifer's and Miranda's urging, we went straight to Helena's apartment on our own, the two of us, so we could cool our heels. It was a relatively special night because I finally felt a lot less dumb. And Helena felt a lot more beautiful, she said. Next evening, back at Shangri-La, we celebrated symmetry, we four, like super partners all, in space-time, real-time, and, of course, uncertainly. How else?